Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm here with Leslie Hollywood from Rally for Our Rights. And as you guys may or may not know, the quote unquote assault weapons ban bill passed the House yesterday. A lot of people are contacting us asking, you know, what are the next steps? It has not become law. Uh, it still has a few more steps to accomplish, and we're hoping to beat it so that it doesn't become law. But I asked Leslie to come back on my show because she's probably the, one of the most knowledgeable people that I know regarding this and um, and just kind of like run us through everything that's happening and what steps we can take. So Leslie, why don't we just do like a little recap as to what has happened so far? Yeah, well, thank you again for having me back on the show. I, it's such an important issue to talk about this and really kind of get the facts out about what is going on because it's definitely getting too close to, to or too close for comfort uh, for me and I'm sure for everyone else as well. Um, anyone that watched any of the previous uh, videos that we did, I, I kind of started out by talking how a bill is made. So if you aren't sure how a bill is made, you can go back and watch the beginning of either of those videos and you will uh, get the, the process that we actually have to get this bill through. Um, so the assault weapons ban is uh, HB 24-1292, if you want to Google it and look it up and, and read the bill itself. And that bill has now passed the entire House chamber within the Colorado General Assembly. So what that means is that it had to start at the, the um, Judiciary Committee. That was a public hearing. There was 12 hours of public testimony. Um, and they had to, they cut it off at 12 hours. There were still hundreds of people uh, signed up to testify that day. Once it passed that hearing, it actually went through to a vote, and this just happened Friday, um, a vote of the entire House chamber. And so that was every member of the the House side of the legislature, which is 65 members. It's um, the Democrats have a super majority in there. So it went to that vote on Friday, and that was actually a very very long day. The Republicans in down at the Capitol right now, even though they have the minority, I have to give them some huge, huge kudos on this. They just, even though they know this is a losing battle for them in the House, they just fought and fought and fought for us on Friday. And I just want to make sure people know that I so much appreciate their voices down there because um, it, it's not an easy, easy feat right now. Uh, so they, you know, after a, a pretty much five, it ended up being five hours because uh, House uh, Speaker Monica, or the House Majority Leader Monica Duran, she actually cut off um, the debate on the House floor at five hours. So for five hours, they just ran amendments. The re Republicans ran amendments. They talked about what's wrong with this bill. They worked on educating their fellow uh, Democrat members there in the House and just very, very long process. It's It can be watched on YouTube. You can actually go back and find Friday on the Colorado channel is what it's called. Um, you can watch through that process if you want to. In the end, which is always amazing to people, it's very anticlimactic when it ends because in the end, all of a sudden they go through from this very heated debate to all of a sudden, okay, let's go ahead and vote on this bill. And it's actually done through a voice vote, which basically means that Everyone who is in support says I, and everyone who is opposed says no, and then whoever's louder supposedly wins. Because the Democrats hold the supermajority, it doesn't actually matter who's louder. It pretty much just matters who the Speaker of the House wants to say won that little voice vote. And of course, it was given to the the, the eyes, and the eyes have it, and the bill passed second reading. Um, from there, it, they immediately turned around and they scheduled it on a Sunday. So this was kind of interesting. Obviously, usually government doesn't work on Sundays. Uh, they called the legislature in this past Sunday to hear this bill on third reading. Um, they called that third re reading and final passage. Third reading is a little bit different, only in the way that they can't um, submit amendments like they can in second reading. So we didn't see any amendments uh any amendments submitted or anything like that, but they did. It was everybody who wanted to speak, every member of the, the House who wanted to speak had 10 minutes to get up there and say their piece and, and try to convince their uh, colleagues to vote the way that they think they should vote. Again, the Republicans just absolutely um, dominated that entire time. They, they used every 10 minutes that they could to just get that the message out, to continue to get the word out. Um, 
and honestly kind of slow down the process a little bit, which is appreciated. And in the end, the third and final reading goes to an actual recorded vote. So in the end, we had every Republican and nine Democrats vote against the bill. Um, I was actually surprised to see nine Democrats uh, vote against that. That that was a surprise for me. Um, I thought we'd see a couple. Nine was nine was a lot. So that was yeah. a big deal that we definitely have some opposition that's crossing those party lines. And unfortunately, it passed a 35 to 27. So even though we had nine Democrats vote with Republicans, still not enough to kill this bill in the House. From there, it will move on into the Senate where the process will start all over again, starting with that committee. Um, the Judiciary Committee is what the committee it should be assigned to a public hearing. Again, it will go through all the steps again, if it even makes it through that very first committee. Yeah, absolutely. I was surprised, too, to see that nine Democrats voted against it. And what I thought was even more surprising is six out of the nine uh, representatives were female. And I had joked on Twitter, I'm like, wow, these females, you know, have bigger balls than most of their colleagues. Um, th but that was like, I mean, that was great to see. And I was really proud of those people. And if anybody wants their information to thank those nine Democrats for voting in our favor, um, I think I'm going to list those emails in the uh, YouTube video because I do think that we owe them a favor. And I've gotten a lot of pushback against that because even on Friday, we found out who voted no. And I asked people, it was like five Democrats at the time, and I asked people to thank them for it. And people are like, why? So, you know, thank them for doing their job. But if you look at some of these Democrats, a lot of them voted against it, even though their district is very much Democrat. So it really wasn't even in their best interest to vote to help us. It was probably in their best interest to vote and say yes, to be in favor of the bill. Um, and I think that it's important to keep things classy and show that we are appreciative. I don't think that, you know, it hurts at all. One thing that I do want to share is uh, as of recently, um, and I don't think I've been public about this at all yet, but I was able to meet with one of the Democrats um, who were who was voting on this bill, and they reached out because they didn't have any any knowledge about firearms, and um, they did what I think most Democrats should have done. You know, instead of voting based on emotions, like look at the facts, and uh, so met with her aide and had been talking back and forth. So we met in person at the Capitol last week. I was at the Capitol last week for eight hours and then also testified against some of these anti-gun bills. And then um, since we've been messaging, texting back and forth, and I'm trying to send her as much information as possible, all of these stats. And sure enough, to my surprise, uh, it actually worked. And she vote she voted against this bill, which is just, I don't know, it was a very, it was like a big accomplishment for me because I do think that I think that a lot of times we give slack to, you know, Democrats and we think that they're all bad, but a lot of them really just want to vote for their constituents or what they think is going to be best. And sometimes that doesn't mean that because they fall under a certain party line that they're just bad, you know, they're bad people. Um, and I think that this is proof. And I think that more than ever, it's really important to show respect to the people that could potentially swing both ways. Uh, whereas, you know, the bill sponsors, Elizabeth Epps, Tim Hernandez, and uh, what is it, Garcia, whatever her last name is, those people I'm like, I could care less about and I don't have any respect for. But uh, that yeah. said, go yeah, ahead. and well, and I just want to, you know, I want to kind of um, run with that a little bit, because as you know, you and I behind the scenes when you were talking with that, um, that representative that, that you're referring to who did end up in the end voting against this bill, she is not in a swing district. She is in, she is in a hard Democrat district. And she, like many of these Democrats, are just simply ignorant about guns. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that she reached out, well, it started by you reaching out and saying, if anybody wants to learn, I'm happy to come talk to anyone. You know, you, you don't, you didn't use rhetoric, you didn't use propaganda, you didn't throw bombs, you just said, hey, I want to come teach you about guns. And you're not very threatening, which helps too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so they said, yeah, and they opened their door to you and you went to the Capitol and you met with her and you, and you did what needed to be done, which was education, not propaganda, not rhetoric, but education. Because the truth is, is when you actually break down these bills, the facts are scary enough. Like we don't necessarily have to start throwing out everything in some sort of an extreme way. We can talk about the simple facts of what 
is in these bills, you know, how extreme they are, how broad reaching this, this bill is in particular. And that's really ultimately what ended up likely changing her mind, as you know, and as I know, since I was talking to you behind the scenes about it, um, she really was undecided and she was undecided probably until yesterday. So yeah. I think that that that's, you know, it, it's, it shows that we can reach and maybe it's one at a time, but, um, yeah, I think what you did, I'm, I'm super proud of you for doing that. Honestly, I think that's just, just really, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to essentially cross enemy lines, but it shows that it can be effective. Um, so I think that's fantastic. Um, and the other thing too, is that people do want to reach out and thank, um, people for the, for the work, you know, whether I, I, you know, I know you said you want to list the Democrats, um, who voted against this bill, but I also recommend reaching out to all the Republicans who fought too, mm -hmm. because honestly, they just get so much, everyone's like, where are the Republicans right now? You know where they are, they're down there fighting. Um, yeah. they're just such a minority. It's not very loud. Yeah. And all like they did such a fantastic job. I mean, you and I, we've been watching these, uh, the floor, uh, debates very closely. I mean, at this point, like I'm hooked, I couldn't peel away from it. I was glued to my computer screen. It was bad. It was like watching a really like a reality TV show that is actually a reality. And, um, and then as, as soon as you get to know a lot of these representatives and I mean, it's just, it's really hard to get pulled away, but I was really proud of all of the Republicans that spoke up and they all had really great, um, you know, really great things to say and, and came with actual like statistics and stuff. And I can't be more proud of all of the Republicans. So I do, yeah, I do think that that's also important and I'm going to list their emails as well because I'm sure that they would be more than happy to hear from you because they are probably tired. I know just a day of spending at the Capitol and debating, it just wears me out for days after. So I can't even imagine what they go through and, and have to deal with this to just constantly keep, you know, uh, chugging along every day. Um, all right. So now next steps, everyone's probably wondering, all right, what can I do? So now more than ever, it's really important that we contact the senators that are going to be voting on this bill. I've comprised, well, Leslie helped me, we've comprised a list of potential senators that could change their mind. And um, if you go to my website, gunfunny.com or Leslie's website, rallyforourrights.com, you will see a list. Like I know on my website, if you just go to the top of the page and click where it says contact your representatives or maybe your senators, one click will send an email to everyone and it is BCC'd. So it's not like it's going to look like a, a mass email, but really important to be, you know, uh, polite and, and just tell them why you don't think that this bill should pass. And I hate to say it, but like guys, the whole thing, like, you know, shall not, you know, infringe our constitution, like all of that is falling on deaf ears. I would say that you know, as a female, I use guns that have muzzle brakes on them because it tames recoil, or I own a, a ranch and I use these guns to protect my livestock. I mean, there's so many things that you can come up with that is going to resonate with these Democrats more so than just, you know, screw you and it's the constitution. Um, so I would say, you know, recommend like, uh, reach out to these people, contact them and, uh, and, and try to convince them. And I do think that there's a lot to be said about power and numbers. So we want to blow up their emails. We also, um, if you go to that, that link as well, there's, uh, their phone numbers and I would say flood their inboxes as well with that too, and let them know that their constituents do not want this to pass, that it is not the majority that wants them to pass. Unlike what a lot of these Democrats are saying. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with everything that you just said. As far as what happens next, kind of the procedural part of it, because I think that's kind of where um, people kind of get a little confused. So what will happen next from here is the Senate president, who's Steve Fenberg. Steve Fenberg is from Boulder, so there's no flipping Steve Fenberg. He has told the Colorado Sun that he himself would vote for this bill, but he actually admitted that he doesn't think he has the, the Senate chamber has the support to actually get it passed. So mm -hmm. it's very, even to him, he thinks it's very uncertain whether or not this will make it anywhere in the Senate. Um, but he is the one who's going to be responsible for getting this assigned to a committee. We anticipate it being assigned to a Senate Judiciary. There's many other committees. In the end, they could do something weird and put it in another committee. If it goes to Senate Judiciary, that, that's a five-member committee, um, two Republicans, two Democrats, 
of the two Democrats, one of them is actually the Senate sponsor. So we know those two Democrats are not going to swing at all. There is one Democrat, Dylan Roberts, and he is from the Route County uh, Steamboat Springs area. So he's up there where they have a lot of livestock. That's where the wolves were just released. Um, he's, he's definitely got a very different type of constituency, even though he's a Democrat. Because of that, he tends to be a little more moderate on guns. And I would really recommend people kind of reach out to him. I do think it's incredibly important right now that we are very careful with our words. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would do if you reach out to him is I would simply ask him where he stands on this bill. You can get a lot of information on that. You can say, where do you stand on this bill? Here's why I oppose it. If you're from that area, especially, gosh, please, please reach out to him. Nice. Um, he, he will be that swing vote in there for sure. So if he, for some reason, decides to vote and move this bill forward, then we're kind of like all hell breaks loose. If we can kill this in committee because we can get Dylan Roberts to um, maintain his rational stance on guns, um, then we can actually kill this in that committee and it's done for this year. Doesn't mean we won't see it again next year. I'm sure we will. We should know, I would say sometime today, which committee this gets assigned to. It, there is zero reason it shouldn't go to Senate Judiciary unless they're doing something funky down there at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, Polis has also said that he's not very excited about it. Um, so when we have the governor, our Democrat governor, our, our um, Democrat Senate majority leader, um, I'm sorry, our Democrat Senate president, um, basically both of them saying the, the poll is saying he's not excited about the bill. The Senate president saying he doesn't think it can make it through the Senate chamber at all. Um, it definitely gives us some some hope that we can actually fight this. So I do think that's really important that people get involved. Um, when you contact these senators, it is really important to please try to be as respectful as possible. We have to understand the Republicans are already voting with us. We, we aren't talking to Republicans. We're talking to Democrats who would otherwise be against what we're trying or would otherwise be on the other side of us. And it, we need to we need to get those people to change their minds. And that doesn't happen by throwing bombs at them. That happens by educating them. If you have information that you can use to educate them, if you have information about how you use these uh, these um, weapons that would be banned under this bill, share that with them. That's the kind of stuff that is actually going to make them stop and say, hey, maybe I need to learn a little bit more about this. Maybe I need to better understand how this is going to impact my constituency. Um, as we saw what happened with Ava and, and the representative over in the House side, you know, that education can make a difference. So I do really encourage people to go that route. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of stats, uh, there are some statistics that I do want to push out to you guys that Leslie and I stumbled upon with the help of NSSF. And um, so this was from the FBI, and this is uh, this was taken and recorded. So 2020, they took 2020 into account, and this was uh, the murders that took place in 2020, and it defines what weapons were used in what state and what's odd about this is rifles and this does not mean your typical scary assault weapon your ar your ak anything i mean it could be a hunting rifle in 2020 murders uh were uh, i'm sorry eight rifles accounted for uh for murders in 2020 and that's compared to uh, 141 murders that were used with a handgun. So this bill, I feel pretty confident saying that it's going to typically affect, uh, probably most mostly affect rifles and shotguns, but it does plan to ban uh, well over 50% of handguns. Um, so I thought that that was pretty interesting. And in fact, if you kind of just look at all of these statistics, uh, the spreadsheet, um, rifles actually don't account for many deaths all throughout the United States. They don't. And so this this data, this was actually not the data from NSSF. This was uh, within Rally for Our Rights. We have a couple guys who are just phenomenal with with um, FBI data. They even dig into the Office of Gun Violence data here in Colorado, and they just pull out stats that we that we can use for for uh, bills like this. And so they put this together, and I just am so appreciative of them. Um, and I'll actually get this up on our website today so that people can go there. It'll be on our blog, and you can just look through this data yourself. But a couple of things that that I found really interesting too was in Colorado in 2020, like as, as Ava said, 
Um, it was eight, eight deaths. So murder, so murder and homicide are not the same. Homicide is a death by firearm, if that's what we're talking about, but it can also include justified deaths. So murder is actually unjustified. Um, so I like to point that out. Murder statistics are much better to use than homicide statistics. You will always see the gun grabbers use homicide statistics and that's so they can use self-defense um, to actually disarm citizens. So we're talking murder here. And in 2020, eight murders by rifle in Colorado. In 2019, it was actually five. Um, similarly, this was actually also on the, in the same data. So in 2020, there was one murder by shotgun, one in Colorado, one. But if you turn around and because it actually breaks it down even further into other types of murder, um, knives and other sharp objects actually accounted for 40 murders. So when we're looking at them really going after shotguns, really going after rifles, and then, you know, in the end, a lot of handguns too. But when their their goal is to try to convince people that this is some sort of a rifle ban, a scary rifle ban, why aren't we going after knives? And I usually don't use that. I usually don't use that line because you hear it a lot, but I don't, and I don't love it because I think that it's all tragic. But yeah. um, here in Colorado to see them, like that's, that's a pretty big difference. 40 and eight or shotguns is only one. Um, so these statistics are definitely very interesting. Um, and like I said, I'll get them up on our blog today so people can go there and dig through them themselves and, and, you know, pull them out, do whatever you want. These are also great numbers that you can send when you email the senators. Um, send this information over so that they can say, wow, how do I look into this data as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate the guys from Rally for Our Rights putting this information for us, uh, putting it together for us. Um, another thing that I wanted to include is people might be thinking, well, where is 2023 data and stuff like that? But from my understanding, this is the most recent data that we have uh, information for, correct? Correct. Yeah. So the, the way that the data is compiled and released to the, by the FBI to the public, um, 2020 is the most recent that we have. And as soon as 2020 comes out, we can start breaking that down. Uh, yeah. so yeah, so that, that's kind of where that is. It's just lags. Yeah. It's not that we're trying to cover up anything. It's just, that's the most recent data that we have, uh, talking about other statistics. So, uh, we have a friend at NSSF, and he was really helpful in putting together something that I thought was interesting. So he uh, he looked at, well, his team. So they looked at, they went to Gun Broker. And they essentially looked at uh, the first 100 guns that were for sale. And because I was like, well, how how are we coming up with this, you know, this percentage rate that will ban 80% or sometimes we'll hear 85 or sometimes 90% of firearms. So he said, and I'll just read this word for word. He said, national level survey of firearm sales completed this morning, 64% of semi-automatic handguns sold could be, could not be sold in Colorado. 73% of semi-automatic rifles sold could not be sold in Colorado. 91% of semi-automatic shotguns Overall, based on random sample of semi-automatic firearms for sale this morning, 76% would immediately be illegal in Colorado. So mythology, equal number of rifles, shotguns, and handguns selected from a national sales point. Assumption, detachable magazines, threaded barrels, magazines that can be made to carry more rounds or pistol grips were used to identify as non-Colorado compliant. So I thought that was interesting too. So I mean, essentially, like we're not just talking about you know, just a few guns. We're talking about majority of the semi-automatic guns out there that a lot of people are using for protection. This also would eliminate the ability to pass these guns on to people when you pass away. Think about how many people have these gun collections that are worth so much money. I mean, there's people that that's their, that's what they uh, think of like when, you know, that's like their retirement, essentially. They're like, oh, well, guns keep increasing over time. I'm going to put all my, you know, put my money into guns and that'll be my retirement fund. And it's really sad to see how many people this is going to affect. Yeah. And those statistics that uh, Nephi put together was was really great because we hear this and we repeat it, right? This 80% number, where does this come from? And actually I was listening to the radio this morning. I always drive my kids to school and I pop on wait till they're out of the car and I pop on talk radio. And this morning they were talking about this ban passing the house yesterday. And um, I was listening to 850 KOA, which is kind of a more, their morning show is, is very, tends to lean a little bit more left for sure. Um, and they were actually themselves, they kept repeating this 80% 
number, which I'm glad. I'm glad that we are actually getting that out enough or repeating mm -hmm. it enough that it's starting to be repeated by others because it's true. But one of the questions that they have a lot is, well, where does this number come from? How do we know it's 80%? Mm -hmm. um, so it was great getting this data, you know, and, it's, and it can easily be replicated the way that he that he did it. Um, it was great to have that data because now we can actually turn around. That's information that we can provide to all of these senators who are going to be voting on this bill. Um, like this isn't just some crazy number that we're throwing out there, you know, and hoping it will stick. This yeah. is actually based on this information and here's why. And those are the things that will turn some of those votes. Um, in the Senate right now, I can tell you, we definitely have at least two or three or two or three Democrats who are no votes on this bill. Um, so those are already we already have some Democrats who we know are not going to vote th for this. And there's probably there's a lot of others that are on the fence and it's information like this that is going to push them over and say, OK, this is too big of a bill. It's too broad. Um, I support the idea, but I don't support this bill. We, we see that a lot. So we really want to kind of push them to that point. And it's going to be information like this that's going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to think if there's anything else to cover. Um, I I, we could do a quick update of all the other bills because uh, even though a lot of people are fascinated or concentrated on the assault weapons ban bill, there's other bills that are being pushed forward to in um, during the legislative session. Do you should we just highlight those real quick, Leslie, if you don't mind, just so that we can give kind of an up to date as to what's going on. And by the way, even if you guys uh, stumble upon this video five days later and you're like, oh, I don't know if it's you know if it's up to date or not. Leslie has made it super easy for you guys to follow. So just go to rallyforourrights.com. Click on, is it committee watch? A legislative it, watch. Okay, legislative watch. And um, and then you can see exactly when the bills are being heard, when you guys can sign up to testify. There's links to what the bills are, what it means. And then um, if you guys do want to sign up to testify, uh, you would just click on that, click on com uh, community, right? And then go down and click on, I'm trying to think about uh, the process. Everything. Yeah. Uh, and then what do you click on exactly? Well, it's, it's committee. I think it's like, I, I usually choose a committee by hearing number and, and committee type and, and bill number. Um, there's different ways you can do it. You just, you just click on it on the rally for our rights legislative watch page though. Like if there's a bill you're interested in, um, I have like the committee name there and the bill number, and that's the information you're going to need when you pop over to actually sign up to testify. So even if it's pretty easy to kind of follow the directions, once you get over there and you just need to have that information to know what you're looking for. So you can get that on the legislative watch page. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And thank you for keeping us up to date with that. All right. So firearms, uh, firearm liability insurance requirement. What is going on with that bill? And that is HB 24 1270. So this bill did pass uh, its very first committee. Um, it has now moved on to what would be second reading and um, it is being laid over daily. And we watched that happen with the assault weapons bill for almost, almost a month. Um, same thing. It's just every single day they're not hearing it. It's being pushed to the next day on the calendar. So you'll see it pop up on the calendar every day until they decide one day they're going to hear it. Why haven't they heard it? It's um, it's going to be a lot of debate again. It's probably going to be hours of debate. So they've got to make sure that that they're kind of prioritizing their bills down there. Um, but yeah, so you know, keeping an eye on this one. Once we see it move past the second reading, we'll see it move to third reading. It still has it still has a ways to go. And again, I want to remind people the legislative session here in Colorado ends on May eighth. So we're down to what three weeks. Um, so they have to get all these bills passed by May 8th. And if they don't, they die. Yeah. Next is uh, school safety measures, which would eliminate uh, teachers from carrying firearms. And that actually, thankfully, got killed in committee. And that's because there was such an uproar, like so many people that signed up to testify, so many people that sent out emails that the bill sponsor actually just took it off. She, it was killed. Yeah. So that was fun for us. That was great. Yeah. So that one went to committee. I was ready to testify on it and everything. And they that was kind of a little bit of a different group that was opposed to that. It was a lot of parents um, yeah. that that just were like, hell no, you know, mm -hmm. thank goodness. Um, so, yeah. And the, and the bill sponsors just nixed their own bill. So that bill's dead. Yeah. Next, secure firearm storage in a vehicle. I just testified that a few days ago and it did pass. Uh, so now it's 
uh, it is waiting for the next step, but it is how many, how many steps has it taken so far? Is it? So when you testified on it, um, last week, it was in its Senate committee. So it's already, that bill's already passed through the house entirely. And it was at its very first Senate committee when you testified on it. So now they need to get it on the schedule to actually hear it for second and third reading. I do anticipate this one, making it all the way through and getting to the governor's desk. I think they're going to call this one a win in the end. Yeah, which has so many flaws in it. It sounds great in theory. Like, yeah, you should have your gun locked up. Um, and guys, you should be responsible with your firearms. But I don't think it's the government's duty to tell us that. And uh, again, there's a lot of flaws within this bill. Next is firearms dealer requirements and permits. Yeah, so this is, this is, in my opinion, one of the ugliest bills that we're looking at right now. Um, this bill started in the House and it made it through House Business Committee uh, because it had a, a requirement that would require the, the um, firearm retailers to pay $400 a year. It then had to go to a finance committee. So every now and again, we'll see bills go to multiple committees. Um, doesn't happen all the time. It's pretty rare. This is one that had to go through multiple committees. So it made it to that second one, the House Finance Committee. It passed out of House Finance. Now, because it's got a $3 million fiscal note on it that would have to come out of the government's general fund, now it has to go to the Appropriations Committee. Um, Appropriations Committee will have to figure out how they can fit this into the budget that they're working on trying to get passed right now. Um, and it's got, they just scheduled it in appropriations on Wednesday. Again, this bill has a, like we're talking, it's essentially still in step one of seven steps because it's still in these committees. If it passes out of appropriations, um, it will then have to go to second reading in the House, third reading in the House. Then it has to go to the Senate and it has to go to a committee hearing in the Senate. It would have to go to two different readings in the Senate. Is there time to do that? Possibly. They'd yeah. really have to be strategic about how they do it. Um, I think it's going to be really close when we're looking at May 8th being the deadline. So that's yeah. where that builds up. And this bill is horrible. I mean, it essentially is asking CBI to take over, well, not take over, but help ATF and do what ATF is already doing. Just to put it in perspective, ATF spends on average about $27 million a year to keep gun stores in check. And CBI is trying to do this with only $3 million. So it's laughable to say the least. Next is firearms merchant category code. And this unfortunately was just signed by Governor Polis. And this I hate. I hate to see this that this bill now is going to be the law. Um, I think that it definitely affects only these mom and pop stores. I mean, I was even thinking as far as my dad's business goes, because he has all these other businesses that are all in the same merchant, you know, the same they same they use the same merchant for. I question if this would actually even affect him, whereas gun stores that are only gun stores and or ranges, uh, it's now going to give you a certain merchant ca merchant category code whenever you make a purchase, which will then, I mean, if they wanted to, it could be flagged and, uh, and they're going to use that to essentially stop a potential shooting. Yeah, yeah, this this bill is just weird. It was I really listened to the last committee. It became very apparent that actually nobody has any idea how it's going to work. Um, and I, it was just kind of wild listening to them not be able to answer questions. I mean, very legitimate questions like, OK, so this is supposed to stop mass shootings. Who's the person who's going to be responsible for reporting this? Because if they think it's credit card companies, no, real people don't look through all their transactions of credit cards yeah. every day. I mean, you know who does that is you, right? Like the, the merchant mm -hmm. actually does that. But once it goes over to the to Citibank or something, it's not like they've got somebody sitting over there at Citibank like, oh, look at all these gun purchases today. I'm going to call someone. No, it's it's AI. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this, this bill, it, it hasn't been signed yet. It is sitting on the governor's desk. So if people would like to uh, contact him and ask him to veto it, they can. I don't think he will. Um, I want to remind people if he doesn't sign the bill, it becomes law automatically in 30 days. Yeah. And actually, I'm sorry, my, my apologies. I thought that he did sign it. So yeah, there is still time if you guys want to contact Governor Polis. Next is prohibiting carrying uh, firearms in sensitive spaces. Yeah, so this bill was one of the nastiest ones that we saw in the beginning. It has been amended down so much. Um, 
still not a good bill. I, I, you know, I wouldn't sit here and say, yeah, let's support this. Um, one of the things I will tell you, the reason it did actually get amended down was because this bill could not have passed Senate Judiciary, the same committee that we're looking at the assault weapons bill going to. And the reason it wouldn't have passed Senate Judiciary written as it was initially written is because of that senator I mentioned, Dylan Roberts. Dylan Roberts is the reason this bill got amended down to now is is prohibits um, concealed and open carry, any carry at all. Concealed or uh, prohibits all carry on government property, or I mean, in, I mean not, not government property, uh, government buildings. So inside government buildings, exempts parking lots, um, polling locations, and then it includes educational institutions, which would be like colleges and preschools. But there mm -hmm. is a carve out written into it that still allows for like armed security, the faster program we have in Colorado. Um, so this bill has been amended way down from where it was initially, which was just a crazy bill. And it is because of that Dylan Roberts, that's literally how rational he tries to be on guns as a Democrat. And one of the reasons why I think reaching out to him on the, the 1292, the assault weapons ban bill is really important. Um, this bill is going to be up for committee, a committee hearing on, um, this coming Wednesday. It was initially Tuesday. They just changed it to Wednesday and it's, to, to go ahead and, and provide public testimony, um, go to our website, you, the information is there and you can sign up and do it remotely or in person. So that's where that bill's at. I do think this bill is going to also make it all the way through to the end and become law. I think some of these bills, they're going to, they need to have their wins and these are going to be what they are. Yeah. Next is the firearms and ammunition excise tax, which is, I think, what did they amend it down to 10% now? It was 9%. 9 they amended it down. 9%, yeah. But still, that said, when we did the math, we're like, ultimately, it's going to increase taxes by 22 to 30%, even yeah. with that amendment. So um, it's just, it's crazy. And again, like we've said in previous videos, a lot of these bills are uh, essentially making firearm ownership a privilege. It's, it's, I mean, they're basically making it so that it's not affordable for a lot of these lower income people to afford firearms. Yeah, that I call them classist. This is a classist bill. These same people yeah. who rail against the rich are like, only the rich get to have guns. Um, so yeah, this is a very classist bill. Um, if this bill was to pass and become law, it doesn't actually become law. It would uh, put a question on the ballot in November asking voters if they want this excise tax. tax. That's because we have Tabor Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which requires all new taxes or tax increases to go to a vote with the people. Now where this bill is, it made it through the committee. We talked about the committee the last the last video that we did together. It has actually not moved since then. So this bill also needs to go to appropriations because they require some money to get the ballot on the to get the question on the ballot. So there is a kind of a fiscal note to it that needs to go through appropriations. They haven't even scheduled this in appropriations. Um, and then if it they did, it has got to go to second reading, third reading in the House. It would have to go to the Senate to a whole other committee hearing again through the Senate second reading, third reading to ever make it to the governor by May 8th. So I think this bill is dead. I mean, I hate to say that, and that's not usually something that I say, but the fact that they don't even have this on in appropriations on Wednesday, appropriations only meets once a week. They really, I don't know how they could have the time to get this bill through. So um, I think they're probably just going to let it lie. Mm -hmm. We'll see though, for sure. But yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm glad to not see this one have any movement since the last yeah. time we talked about it. Absolutely. And then the last one is concealed carry permits and training. And this one I also testified against last week. Yeah. And this bill, um, if I remember right, this bill has already made it all the way through the House and it just had its very first um, Senate hearing on last, I think it was last Thursday, if I remember right. Yeah, no, um, and that was, yeah. So, and it did pass through the, the very first committee in the Senate. Um, this one, we're also still waiting for it to be added to the schedule uh, for the Senate to hear on second and third reading. If it passes, um, which I kind of anticipate it passing, I think they're going to probably get this one through. You never really know. Somebody's down there who has to, it's pretty much the, the Senate leadership that's got to determine where to take the time to put these bills and are there other bills that are more important when they're getting this close to the end of the legislative session um but yeah so we're just kind of waiting for this one to be scheduled for the next the second reading um in the senate and then eventually third reading if it passes third reading in the senate it goes to the governor um to sign okay 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I do appreciate it. Your knowledge is so much appreciated, especially with all the misinformation out there. Again, guys, if you want to follow what's going on and keep up to date, head on over to Rally for Our Rights. And then also, if you want to contact the senators, which you guys do not need to be in Colorado, we appreciate all hands on deck. Regardless of where you're living, they don't have to know that you're living outside of Colorado. Contact the senators. You can go to gunfunny.com. Click on the, literally, the link at the top of the homepage. It can't be any easier. One click. We'll email everyone. And please be polite about that. And uh, and then we will keep you guys updated as things progress. But hopefully they do not. Yeah. Um, thank you. Everything Ava said is correct. Please reach out, um, put in the legwork here. That's where it starts. And we appreciate all the support to help kill this bill. Thank you.